At number 10, Dyatlov Pass. On the night of February 1st, 1959, nine ski hikers were sent to an early grave due to mysterious reasons in the mountains of Russia. The group set up camp on a slope, enjoyed some food, and prepared for sleep, but something went terribly wrong. On February 26th, a day before my birthday by the way, searchers found an abandoned tent that was ripped open from the inside. Surrounding the area of tents were footsteps with prints of socks, a single shoe, and bare feet. Following the steps led the searchers to the bodies of two individuals, both completely naked except for their underwear. The bodies seemed to have been affected by hypothermia, but medical examiners found that the two individuals along with the other seven found later wouldn't have passed away from hypothermia. Discovered while examining their bodies was one body with evidence of a blunt force trauma consistent with a brutal assault. Another had third degree burns, one had been vomiting blood, one was missing a tongue, and some of their clothing was found to be radioactive. Number 9. Ghost Ship On December 4th, 1872, a British American ship called the Mary Celeste was found empty and adrift in the Atlantic. It was found to be seaworthy and with its cargo fully intact, except for a lifeboat, which it appeared had been boarded in an orderly fashion. But why? We may never know because no one on board was ever heard from again. In November 1872, the Mary Celeste set sail from New York bound for Genoa, Italy. She was manned by Captain Benjamin Briggs and seven crew members, including Briggs' wife and their two-year-old daughter. Supplies on board were ample enough for six months and luxurious, including a sewing machine and an upright piano. Commentators generally agree that to precipitate the abandonment of a seaworthy ship, some extraordinary and alarming circumstances must have arisen. However, the last entry on the ship's daily log reveals nothing unusual, and inside the ship, all appeared to be in order. Number 8, D.B. Cooper Dan Cooper was a passenger on Northwest Airlines Flight 305 from Portland to Seattle, a 30-minute flight. He took his seat, lit a cigarette, and politely ordered a bourbon and soda, for which he paid cash. Shortly after takeoff, he handed a note to a 23-year-old flight attendant, who ignored it at first, assuming it was just the man's phone number. Miss, you'd better look at that note, Dan Cooper told her. I have an explosive. The note's exact wording is part of the mystery, since Cooper reclaimed it after the flight attendant read it. But his demands were for $200,000 in negotiable American currency worth $1 million today. Four parachutes and a fuel truck standing by in Seattle to refuel the plane on arrival. The flight attendant brought the demands to the captain. The airline's president authorized full cooperation. The other passengers had no idea what was happening, having been told that landing was delayed due to mechanical difficulties. At 5.39 p.m., the plane landed, an airline employee delivered a cash-filled knapsack and parachutes, and Cooper allowed all passengers and two flight attendants to leave the plane. During refueling, Cooper outlined his plan to the crew, a southeasterly course toward Mexico with one further refueling stop in Nevada. Two hours later, the plane took off. When it landed in Reno, Cooper's absence was noted. Cooper, whom the media mistakenly refer to as D.B. Cooper, was never seen or heard from again. No parachute was found, and the ransom money was never used. At number 7, Living Statues Encephalitis lethargica, aka the sleeping sickness, first appeared in Europe and quickly spread around the world, reaching epidemic levels in North America, Europe, and India by 1919. About a third of those stricken with the illness passed away. Of the survivors, nearly half eventually found themselves unable to physically interact with the world around them, all the while fully aware of their surroundings, like sleep paralysis. Though occasionally capable of limited speech, eye motion, and even laughter, they generally appeared as living statues, totally motionless for hours, days, weeks, or years. The cause is unknown, but one theory is brain inflammation triggered by a rare strain of streptococcus the bacteria responsible for many sore throats each year. Science's best guess is that the bacteria mutated, provoking the immune system to attack the brain, leaving the victim helpless. Number six, ruins of the past. It's not unusual to find junk in Brazil's Guanabara Bay, but what Robert Marx unearthed there in 1982 was an unusual kind of foreign matter, 
In an underwater field the size of three tennis courts located 15 miles from shore lay the remains of some 200 Roman ceramic jars, a few fully intact. According to Marx, a professional treasure hunter, the jars appeared to be twin-handled amphora that were used to transport goods such as grains and wine in the 3rd century. But how did they get there? The first Europeans didn't reach Brazil until 1500. The Romans, who traded primarily in the Mediterranean port cities and the Middle East, had little incentive to invest in ships that could cross oceans. However, they did sail as far as India. Perhaps some untrained navigator lost his way in the storm, or maybe mutineers steered the ship westward. Number 5. The Voynich Manuscript the Voynich Manuscript is a roughly 250 page book written in an entirely unknown language slash writing system. It's been carbon dated back to the 1400s and includes illustrations of plants that don't resemble any known species. It's named for the Polish book dealer who purchased it in 1912. It is believed to have been intended as a medical text. Its first confirmed owner was George Barish, an alchemist from Prague who discovered it, taking up space uselessly in his library. Barish tried to investigate the manuscript's origins to no avail. The manuscript changed hands for centuries until it was purchased by Voynich, who posited that it was authored by Albertus Magnus, an alchemist, or Roger Bacon, an early scientist. However, some believe that Voynich fabricated the manuscript and its history all by himself. Various other hoaxes have been proposed over the years. Of course, that wouldn't explain the carbon dating of the paper and ink. Centuries after its alleged discovery, the Voynich manuscript remains as impenetrable and inexplicable as ever. Number 4. Walter Collins In 2008, Clint Eastwood's film Changeling reawakened interest in one of the most bizarre and tragic crime stories of the 1920s. Single mom Christine Collins reported her son Walter missing in March 1928 from their home in Los Angeles. Five months later, the police brought Walter back to Christine, except it wasn't Walter. And Christine knew it. Why are you doing this, Mrs. Collins? You have stopped looking for my son. Why should we that be looking for someone we've already found? But the LEPD dismissed Christine's concerns, going so far as to accuse her of terrible mothering and having her committed to a mental hospital. The real Walter Collins was never found, and over time, authorities came to believe he was one of the victims of convicted executioner Gordon Stewart Northcott, although Northcott's mother offered a confession for ending Walter. Whatever happened to Walter Collins, his body was never found, and no one ever learned what really happened. Nor has it been established with any certainty why the police were so invested in covering up the boy's disappearance that they brought a different child back to Christine and tried to convince her and the rest of the world that it was Walter. Number 3. Flannan Isles Disappearances In 1900, three keepers of the Flannan Isles lighthouse off the west coast of Scotland disappeared under the strangest of circumstances. The lighthouse was manned by a three-person team, Thomas Marshall, James Ducat, and Donald MacArthur, with a fourth man rotating in from shore. On Boxing Day, December 26th of 1900, the relief keeper arrived to find none of the lighthouse keepers present. The only sign that anything was amiss was an overturned chair near the kitchen table. No bodies were ever found, which has led to endless speculation. Theories range from drownings to abduction by foreign spies, a ghost ship, or a giant sea monster. Whatever happened back in December 1900 at the Flannan Isles Lighthouse, we may never know. Perhaps this was one of the inspirations for the Lighthouse film. Whoever's watching this, you need to watch The Lighthouse, directed by Nathan Eggman. It's a banger. It's in 4-3 aspect ratio and it's only black and white. Mmm, slapper. Anyways, number two, Circleville Letters. In 1976, residents of Circleville, Ohio began receiving hate mail that has wreaked havoc ever since. The letters postmarked from Columbus were invasive and accusatory, highlighting a supposed affair between school bus driver Mary Gillespie and the school superintendent. One letter addressed to Mary's husband, Ron, threatened his life if he didn't put a stop to the affair. By 1977, the husband was gone from the world, the result of a suspicious one-car crash involving shots fired. When the sheriff ruled the passing an accident, however, residents began receiving letters accusing the sheriff of a cover-up. 
The letters continued throughout the 1970s and early 1980s, and even after Ron's sister's husband, Paul Fresher, was convicted of writing the letters and attempting to end Mary via a booby trap rigged pistol, even with Fresher in prison, however, the letters continued. He even received one himself. In 1994, Fresher was released and he maintained his innocence until his passing in 2012. The true identity of the Circleville letter writer remains unknown. Some still believe it was Fresher, others believe it was Mary herself, and that she used the letters to concoct and support the perfect execution of her own husband. Number 1. What list about mysteries would be complete without Area 51? Area 51 in southern Nevada is a US military base, the very existence of which was unconfirmed until 2013, when the CIA was obliged to respond to a Freedom of Information Act request from 2005. Based on historical evidence, it would appear that Area 51 supports the development and testing of experimental aircraft and weapons. Public satellite images, such as those available on Google Maps, don't provide any insight. Even those with security clearance to visit Area 51 are transported there from Las Vegas via an airline called Janet, whose planes are unmarked and which shrouds its windows upon descent. The intense secrecy around Area 51 has sparked rumors that the government uses it to house crashed UFOs and conduct lab tests on aliens. Other theories about what Area 51 is used for include research on time travel, research on teleportation, meetings with extraterrestrials, development of a means for weather control, and activities related to a shady one world government. 10. Teddy Wang Teddy Wang was born in Shanghai, China to Wenzhenese parents, the son of paint and chemical business proprietor Wang Dinshin. He was a childhood playmate of Kung Yu Sam, and in 1948, when she was 11 and him being 15, they renewed their friendship, and they married in 1955. The Wangs moved to Hong Kong, and the business became the China Chem Group, eventually becoming one of the territory's largest and most powerful companies due to its lucrative pharmaceutical division. Wang was abducted on the 12th of April 1983, when his Mercedes-Benz was hijacked. He was taken away and chained to a bed for 8 days until Nina Wang paid a ransom of 33 million Hong Kong dollars. I feel like Hong Kong dollars is not the word for it. Until Nina Wang paid a ransom of 33 million dollars. Wang was kidnapped again on the 10th of April 1990 as he left the jockey club in Hong Kong. His abductors demanded 60 million dollars this time. His wife Nina paid an installment of 34 million, but Wang was not returned. Several of the alleged kidnappers were caught and said that the 56 year old Wang had been thrown into the sea from a sampan on the 13th of April. If you don't know what a sampan is, it's a kind of boat. His body was never found and he was declared legally removed in 1999. Number 9, Annie McCarrick. McCarrick was born on Long Island, New York, and she lived there until her move to Ireland in January 1987. McCarrick disappeared on March 26, 1993. She had left her apartment in Dublin, Ireland, so that she could go to the Wicklow Mountains for the day. She had asked a friend to accompany her, but her friend declined. CCTV captured images of McCarrick in the Allied Irish Bank location in Sandy Mount, where she was seen withdrawing money from her bank account. She did some shopping at Quinsworth Supermarket before returning to her apartment at 3 p.m. She was seen on a bus at around 3.40 p.m. in Ranelagh heading toward Enniscary. Sometime later that evening, between 8 p.m. and 10 p.m., the doorman at Johnny Fox's pub in Glen Cullen claims to have seen McCarrick at the pub, accompanied by a young man who was wearing a wax jacket. Investigators believe the man looks something like this and issued this photo fit at the time. Allegedly, McCarrick had gone to see an Irish music and dancing show that was a traditional event called the Hooli Show, but did not realize that there was a cover charge. McCarrick's male friend then paid for her and accompanied her in to watch the show. Nobody saw either McCarrick or her male friend leave the pub and the man's identity has never been discovered. Number 8. Aaron Mary Gilbert On July 1st, 1995, Gilbert accompanied David Combs, a man whom she had met several days prior at a bar called Chilku Charlie's in Anchorage, to the Girdwood Forest Fair in Girdwood, Alaska, a village south of Anchorage. The two left Anchorage at approximately 4pm. Gilbert was last seen at the fair's beer garden with Combs before they left at approximately 6pm. 
At the time, she was wearing a black leather jacket, a black and white shirt, mountain boots, and black jeans. By Combs' account, he and Gilbert returned to his car, but found the battery not working, as he had left the headlights on. He claimed he told Gilbert he was going to a nearby friend's home to get help, and walked for around two hours, but was unable to locate his friend's residence. When he returned, Gilbert was no longer in the car. According to Combs, he assumed Gilbert had returned to the fair, and found that he was able to start the car engine. He then returned to the fairgrounds and searched for Gilbert unsuccessfully until approximately 1 in the morning. Number 7. Amy Bechtel on the morning of July 24th, 1997, Bechtel told her husband, Steve, that she was planning on running several errands in town after teaching a children's weightlifting class at the Wind River Fitness Center. She stopped at Camera Connection, a photo store near her home in Lander, around 2.30 p.m. after teaching her class. Following her time at the photo store, she stopped by Gallery 331, where she spoke to the proprietor, Greg Wagner. Wagner noted that Bechtel seemed hurried, and repeatedly glanced at her watch during their conversation. Wagner's was the last confirmed sighting of Bechtel. After leaving the photo shop, it is believed by authorities that Bechtel drove to the Shoshone National Forest to practice the course of an upcoming 10K run she was enrolled to compete in. According to an eyewitness driving on Loop Road through the forest that afternoon, a woman resembling Bechtel was seen running along the road wearing black shorts similar to those she had worn earlier that day. At 4.30 p.m., Steve returned home after having spent the day with a friend and found his wife absent. At 10.30 p.m., he called the police to report his wife missing. At 1 in the morning on the morning of July 25th, Bechtel's car, a white Toyota Tercel, was discovered parked on a turnout at Burnt Gulch in Lander. Number 6. Suzanne Lyle on the night of March 2nd, 1998, Suzanne Lyle, an undergraduate at the State University of New York at Albany, left her job at the Babbage's in Crossgates Mall in the nearby suburb of Westmere after the store had closed. She is believed to have taken a city bus from the mall back to the university's uptown campus, where a classmate has said she saw Lyle get off the bus at Collin Circle, a short walk from her dorm. She has never been seen again. The next morning, Lyle was reported missing. That afternoon, her credit card was used at a nearby convenience store's ATM to withdraw $20. According to her boyfriend, only she and he knew the pin. He had a verified alibi for the time of her disappearance, but due to his later refusal to cooperate with the police, they have been unable to completely rule him out as a suspect. A man who used the ATM around the same time has also been ruled out. New York State Police continue to investigate the case. Number 5. Gilbert Winter Winter worked as an enforcer for the Adams Family Crime Syndicate. In 1994, allegedly with assistance from fellow enforcer and future crime boss Ray Barton, he executed substance dealer Claude Mosley with a samurai sword as punishment for pocketing profits from a substance operation run by the Adams Family. He went on trial for the slaughter, but key witnesses refused to give evidence against him, one preferring to go to jail for contempt of court, and the case was dropped. On the 9th of March 1998, Winter left the house he shared with his girlfriend driving off in her Nissan Micra. Later that day, he spoke to her by phone but did not disclose his location. Winter was never seen again, and the car was subsequently discovered abandoned in June. His bank account, credit card, and mobile phone have not been used since then. There are two main theories for the disappearance, both hinging on a leafy substance deal where 800,000 British pounds went missing. Either Winter double-crossed the Adams family, stole the money, and was removed accordingly in retribution, allegedly being buried somewhere in the foundations of the Millennium Dome, or fled to the Caribbean with the money and remained in hiding. Regardless, he was never found. Number 4. Maura Murray Murray, a nursing student at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, was last seen on New Hampshire Route 112 at the scene of a minor one-vehicle accident, in which her car was disabled after crashing into a roadside snowbank. Earlier on the day of her disappearance, she had lied to professors about a passing in her family, stating that she would be absent from class for a week. A school bus driver who happened upon Murray's crash site stopped to ask if she needed help, and Murray declined. Upon returning home a short time later, the bus driver called police anyway, but by the time first responders arrived, 10 minutes later, Murray had vanished. Her keys, along with bank and credit cards, have never been located, despite extensive searches of her abandoned car and the neighboring wooded areas. Number 3. Ray Gricar 
At 11.30 in the morning on April 15th, 2005, Grakar called for Nicola to inform her that he was driving through the Brush Valley area northeast of Center Hall. Grakar failed to return home and late that evening, for Nicola reported him missing. The following day, investigators identified Grakar's red Mini Cooper in the parking lot of an antique store in Lewisburg. The car contained his county-issued cell phone, but not his laptop, computer, keys, or wallet. Investigators identified no signs of foul play. Police and family members noted that the location of the vehicle adjacent to two bridges over the Susquehanna River bore some similarities to the location of the vehicle of Grikar's older brother Roy when he decided to take his own life in 1996. In the days following the discovery of Grikar's vehicle, authorities searched the river and its banks but found no sign of him. Police also noted that a sniffer dog's behavior around where Grikar's car was found suggested that he might have gotten into another vehicle with someone else. Pennsylvania authorities asked the FBI to analyze Grikar's bank accounts, credit card records, and cell phone records, but found no clues as to where he might have been. On July 30th, fishermen discovered Grikar's county-issued laptop in the Susquehanna River beneath a bridge between Lewisburg and Milton, but its hard drive was missing. Divers searched the area of the river near where it was found over the next several days, but found nothing else. Two months later, someone discovered a hard drive on the banks of the Susquehanna River about 100 yards, or 91 meters, from the location of the laptop. And investigators hypothesized that it had come from his computer. However, it was badly damaged in analysis by the FBI and the US Secret Service, and the data recovery firm Kroll on Track failed to recover anything from it. Number two, Robert Levinson. Levinson was a retired US DEA and FBI agent. He was last seen in the custody of who seemed to be Iranian intelligence agents on the 9th of March 2007 on Kish Island. He had gone there to set up a meeting with Dawood Salahuddin, an American-born convert to Islam, ostensibly about securing the Iranian government's help in controlling the distribution of pirated American cigarettes in Iran. He was later revealed to be working for the CIA at that time as well. In 2010, a video of him somewhat emaciated was released. I have been held here for three and a half years. I am not in very good health. I am running very quickly out of diabetes medicine. In which he begs for help from the US government to be released. The US government has regularly raised the issue of his release with Iran as part of talks between the countries. But Iran's statement as to whether he still is in their custody or even alive have been contradictory. And Levinson is thought to be no longer under their control if he is still alive. His family announced on the 25th of March 2020 that he is presumed to have passed away. Number one, Jamie Fraley. In the early hours of April 8, 2008, Jamie Fraley of Gastonia, North Carolina, United States, told a friend over the phone that she was going to the hospital for the third time in the last 24 hours due to a stomach flu. When asked who was taking her there, Fraley said it was another friend and declined to further identify that person. She has not been seen since. Her cell phone was found a few days later, but provided no useful information as to her whereabouts. Investigators initially believed she had met with foul play and began focusing on Ricky Simon Sr., her fiance's father, who lived in the same apartment complex as a person of interest. He had driven Fraley to the hospital on one of her previous visits that day and had a criminal record that included prison time for manslaughter after he had strangled a girlfriend in the 1980s. However, the investigation ended two months later when Simons was found passed away, apparently of heat stroke in the trunk of a former girlfriend's car. In 2015, a prison inmate confessed that he had terminated Fraley, but he was incarcerated at the time Fraley disappeared. Number 10, John Dillinger. John Dillinger, one of the most notorious criminals in American history, was often glorified by the American media for his daring bank heists and thrilling prison escapes. He operated in the 20s and 30s during the Great Depression era and was idolized by many as the modern day Robin Hood because he stole from those same institutions that were capitalizing on the American people's misfortunes. Dillinger's career as a criminal included over 11 bank robberies throughout the Midwest in which he stole in excess of three 
$300,000 and three separate jailbreaks. The mystique surrounding Dillinger's exploits was so captivating that people often forgot or turned a blind eye to the fact that he was responsible for at least 10 slaughters, including that of a sheriff, the passings of several innocent bystanders, and that he left a trail of carnage in his wake. Dillinger's activities, however, did not go unnoticed by Chief Investigator Melvin Purvis of the FBI, who is assigned the task of bringing Dillinger and his gang to justice. When J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI named Dillinger the first public enemy number one on his 31st birthday in 1934, his fame took on a new meaning, and his name and face became recognizable in every household throughout the Midwest and the rest of the country. There was even a $10,000 reward for his capture. Now a public figure, Dillinger turned to plastic surgery to alter his identity and evade Purvis and the rest of the law enforcement community. In those days, plastic surgery was not as common as it is today, and the medical procedures were primitive, dangerous, time-consuming, and very painful. Dillinger underwent several bouts of plastic surgery, some more successful than others, but in the end, he only managed to slightly alter his appearance. After one round of plastic surgery, from which he was extremely disappointed to find that he still looked the same, one of the doctors suggested that he remove his fingerprints as a way to escape being detected. Dillinger liked this idea and elected to undergo the painful process of obliterating his fingerprints. Number 9, Freddie Thompson. According to the New York Times, Freddie Thompson, 35, switched places with another prisoner during an arraignment. The other prisoner was facing a less serious charge of a leafy substance possession, and consequently, Thompson was mistakenly released. Thompson, who was caught for attempted execution and served prison time after pleading guilty to a lesser count including robbery charges, managed to fool authorities by making the identity change. It is unclear how exactly he was able to pose as the other prisoner during his arraignment in a Staten Island courtroom. The mistake points to a series of recent problems by the area's law enforcement agencies. In February, a prisoner posed as a different defendant at an arraignment on a lesser charge. That fugitive, Michael Bautista, 22, is still at large. Police Commissioner Raymond Kelly has rejected the idea that the escaped prisoner exploited a possible loophole. There are ways to verify a prisoner's identity, including checking pictures, he said, but apparently that may not have been done appropriately. Each year, about 400,000 arrests are made and prisoners are processed. The judge released Thompson on his own recognizance. Thompson walked out of court scot-free. It wasn't until several hours later when the prisoner who Thompson impersonated asked why his name hadn't been called that authorities realized a mistake had occurred. Number 8, Bella Kiss. Bella Kiss was a Hungarian serial executioner who cops believe ended 24 people. Kiss was nicknamed the Hungarian Pickler because he preserved his victims' bodies in large barrels. Born in Hungary in 1877, he had a rough childhood. In 1912, only a year after marrying his much younger wife, he discovered she was having an affair. Soon after, she and her lover would disappear. Although Kiss claimed that they had left together for a better life in America, the truth was that he ended both of them, becoming Kiss's first victims. This was the start of his execution spree, but for the rest of his victims, he lured women in. Through personal ads in the local Budapest newspaper, he placed ads under the name of Hoffman, claiming to be a lonely widower looking for marriage. He connected with women who were generally well off and whose families were not living nearby. His good looks and personable charm helped to attract them. He was even able to have some of the women sign over their wealth and give him money. Number 7, Frank Morris. In 1960, Frank Morris was sentenced to serve a prison term at Alcatraz. You know the place. The infamous penitentiary was built in 1934 on an island in the middle of San Francisco Bay. Isolated in the water more than a mile from San Francisco, it was designed as an inescapable jail. But when brothers Clarence and John Anglin got to Alcatraz in 1961 and befriended Morris, the trio decided to put the island's reputation to the test. The three men stuffed plaster dummies in their cell beds in the middle of the night. With roving guards believing the men were asleep, they quietly escaped through carefully cut holes in their cells. Once outside, they fashioned a makeshift raft out of raincoats and set sail into the bay in the middle of the night. They were never seen again. Initially, prison guards assumed the three men had been eaten by sharks. That is still a distinct possibility, but ocean currents would have undoubtedly brought body parts up to shore. Instead, no trace of the men's remains, clothes, or raft has ever been found. Because of that, authorities aren't actually certain whether they successfully escaped or not. 
If they did escape, however, you bet that they changed their names and their identities. Number six, between the spring of 1968 and the fall of 1969, three women were terminated in Glasgow, Scotland. Patricia Docker was strangled to passing in February 1968. Her crime went unpunished. A year later, Jemima McDonald was strangled in a nearby neighborhood. Two months after that, Helen Puttick was also brutally ended in Glasgow. By then, cops started to realize similarities in all three slaughters. DNA testing wasn't the norm back then, but police picked up on patterns of how the girls were ended and where they were found. Cops also began to hone in on a description of the butcher, a redhead between the ages of 25 and 35 who's around 6 feet 1.8 meters tall. Upon distributing a sketch to the media, cops labeled the butcher Bible John. It came from Puttick's passing. She and her sister had met two men during a night out on the town. Both men were named John. Puttick's date for the evening had an infatuation with quoting the Bible. Throughout the night, he delivered impassioned sermons from the book of Moses. The women jokingly called him Bible John. The name kinda stuck. Number five, Frank Matthews. Frank Matthews was a notorious substance kingpin in the early 1970s. The New York City native was one of the largest suppliers of substances in the United States. His operations stretched from New York to Miami. Police believed Matthews cleared more than $20 million from his substance empire. He had a network of over 200 dealers working for him, all selling substances he bought from Colombian sources. His operation was so successful that it destroyed the profits of the rest of New York City's substance dealers. This led to tensions between Matthews and other dealers. In 1972, two of his associates were ended in a drive-by shooting. Matthews himself narrowly avoided being stopped when an explosive was placed under his car. In 1973, after an arrest, Matthews jumped bail and disappeared. Some believe he was ended by rivals, others say he went into hiding to avoid the lifelong prison sentence that surely would have followed. If he did go into hiding, then we know he changed his identity. That's just the smart thing to do. Number four, the Freeway Phantom. The Freeway Phantom was a self-given moniker for a Washington DC serial butcher who has never been identified. The butcher was active around America's capital in the early 1970s. In total, he ended six young women over a 17 month period. Like the Zodiac Butcher before him, the Freeway Phantom sent creepy messages to the police. After executing 18 year old Brenda Denise Woodard in November 1971, police found a note in one of her pockets. This is tantamount to my insensitivity to people, especially women. I will admit the others when you catch me if you can. Freeway Phantom. The Phantom name stuck as police found more bodies near highways and other main thoroughfares around Washington. Police worked leads in the six passings, including one long look at two ex-cops who were convicted of a separate execution. However, they failed to make any headway in finding the butcher. In 1974, the FBI stepped in and added to the list of suspects. The Freeway Phantom appeared to leave as quickly as he arrived. No more passings were linked to his pattern after that awful 17 month period early in the decade and soon the case went cold. The investigation is still active in DC to this day, though cops have been criticized for shoddy evidence keeping and a lack of progress on the awful case. Number three, Victor Garena. Victor Garena was an employee of a Wells Fargo armored car in West Hartford, Connecticut in 1983. That summer, he was recruited by the militant group Los Machetaros to help with a bank heist. The activist group wanted independence for Puerto Rico. Their clandestine run had previously targeted American government officials. Now they were seeking money to fund their operations. Garena's knowledge of the armored car depot made him a natural recruit for Los Maqueteros leader Juan Enrique Segarra Palmer. When Garana led the heist on September 12, 1983, it all fell into place. The Wells Fargo employee tied up two of his co-workers and injected them with sedatives to make them fall asleep. He then loaded more than $7 million cash into a rental car and drove off. At the time, it was the largest cash heist in American history. Neither Garena nor the money was ever seen again. Sagara Palmer wasn't so lucky. In 1985, the FBI tracked down Sagara Palmer and eight of his Los Maqueteros peers in Puerto Rico. They were extradited to Connecticut and convicted on a variety of charges relating to the bank heist and other events. The ringleader was sentenced to 55 years in prison and served about two decades before being freed in 2004. Garena has likely fared far better though. He was never found. Number two, John Rufo. 
John Rufo is one of the rare escaped fugitives not wanted for a violent crime. The businessman had a lengthy career scamming and defrauding investors to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars. His most lucrative scheme, according to authorities, was to pose as an executive of the Philip Morris Tobacco Company and convince banks to grant him fraudulent loans. Cops claim Rufo went around to banks boasting of a research program called Project Star. He would tell finance officials the project was geared toward developing smoke-free cigarettes for the tobacco giant, and they needed seed money to buy computers for the supposed research. It was all a ruse though. Banks would grant loans to Rufo's company, CCS Inc., and he would simply vanish with the cash. For a while, he got away with the scheme and eventually pocketed some $350 million in phony investments. Number 1. Amado Carrillo In the 1980s and 1990s, Amado Carrillo Fuentes was one of the most successful substance smugglers in North America. The Mexican man created an empire for the Juarez cartel. He smuggled more substances from Colombia to the United States than anyone else in the world. Cops knew him as the Lord of the Skies. For the fleet of private planes he used to fly massive quantities of substances all over the world. However, it all ended in the most unlikely way. Fuentes passed away in 1997 during plastic surgery. The substance kingpin had been trying to change his appearance to avoid being captured by DEA agents. Unfortunately, a surgical mishap left him passed on the operating table. With it, his substance empire came crashing down. For police, Fuentes' passing was bittersweet. The man they'd spent so much years chasing was removed and gone. He never faced justice over his substance empire though. By going to his grave prematurely, Fuentes forever avoided the wrath of the law. At number 10, Joaquin Arquivaldo Guzman Lora. Commonly known as El Chapo, he's a Mexican former substance lord and a former leader within the Sinaloa cartel, an international crime syndicate. He is considered to have been one of the most powerful substance traffickers in the world. Guzman was born in Sinaloa and raised in a poor farming family. He endured physical abuse at the hands of his father and also entered the substance trade through his father, helping him grow a leafy green for local dealers during his early adulthood. Guzman began working with Hector Luis Palma Salazar by the late 1970s, one of the nation's rising substance lords. He helped Salazar map routes to move substances through Sinaloa and into the United States. He later supervised logistics for Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo, one of the nation's leading kingpins in the mid-1980s, but Guzman founded his own cartel in the 1988 after Gallardo's arrest. Guzman oversaw operations whereby many different substances were produced, smuggled into, and distributed throughout the United States and Europe, the world's largest users. He achieved this by pioneering the use of distribution cells and long-range tunnels near borders, which enabled him to export more substances to the United States than any other trafficker in history. Guzman's leadership of the cartel also brought immense wealth and power. Forbes ranked him as one of the most powerful people in the world between 2009 and 2013. At number 9, Jesus Alfredo Salazar Ramirez. His alias is El Muñeco, or El Pelos, who is identified as the current lieutenant of the South Pacific Cartel in the state of Sonora. As stated by Sedina, the Mexican Secretary of National Defense, El Muñeco worked as an administrator under Joaquin Guzman Lora and is believed to be responsible for the execution of the activist Nepomuceno. Moreno. Jesus Alfredo Salazar Ramirez was arrested on the 1st of November 2012 in the municipality of Huiquilucan by military personnel working with the Mexican Attorney's General's office. El Muñeco is considered to be one of the most important lieutenants of Joaquin Guzman Lora, evident from his control of the planting, production, and trafficking of substances in Sonora and in the mountains of Chihuahua, which were sent predominantly to the US. He's linked to various executions, among them the lawyer Ruben Alejandro Cupeda Leos, who was assassinated on the 20th of December 2011 in the city of Chihuahua, Chihuahua. According to the Sedena, he is the assumed assassin of an activist, which occurred on the 28th of November 2011. The activist sought justice for the disappearance of his son and joined the Mexican Indignados movement, led by the poet Javier Cecilia. Number 8, Jose Rodrigo Arachiga Gamboa. His allies is Chino Antrax. He is a high-ranking member of the Sinaloa cartel. He was a leader and founding member of Los Antrax, an armed squadron formed to protect Ismael El Mayo Zambada Garcia, founding member of the Sinaloa cartel. 
He was arrested on the 30th of December 2013 at the Amsterdam airport Schiphol in the Netherlands. At the petition of the United States of America and with the help of Interpol on charges related to substance trafficking, the Sinaloa cartel's loss of partners in Mexico does not appear to have affected its ability to smuggle substances from South America to the USA. On the contrary, based on seizure reports, the Sinaloa cartel appears to be the most active smuggler of a powdery white substance. The reports also demonstrated the cartels possess the ability to establish operations in previously unknown areas, such as Central America and South America, even as far as Peru, Paraguay, and Argentina. It also appears to be most active in diversifying its export markets, rather than relying solely on the United States substance consumption. It has made an effort to supply distributors of substances in Latin America and European countries. At number 7, Juan Manuel Alvarez Inzunza. A high level money launderer for the Sinaloa cartel, he was sentenced to 188 months in prison for his role in a conspiracy to transfer millions of dollars in substance proceeds out of the United States. According to court records starting in 2013, agents with Homeland Security Investigations intercepted the communications of Alvarez Inzunza and other high level Sinaloa cartel members as they discussed the transfer of substance proceeds. Alvarez Inzunza, who had a law degree, and worked as an attorney in Culiacan, Sinaloa, Mexico, regularly received requests originating from the top leadership of the cartel, including Ismail Elmeo Zambada and Joaquin Chapo Guzman, to arrange for the collection of substance proceeds in cities across the United States, including New York, Boston, Chicago, and Detroit. Alvarez and Zunza then worked with associates in Bogota, Colombia, to arrange for the transfer of those funds to Mexico, Central America, and other locations. At number six, Francisco Javier. Javier Arellano Felix, a former Mexican substance lord who, alongside his brothers, founded and led the Tijuana Cartel, aka the Arellano Felix organization, until his capture by the United States Coast Guard on August 16, 2006. The Tijuana Cartel used to be one of the largest Mexican substance cartels. It is well known for its employment of enforcers recruited from Mexican and San Diego street gangs. In addition to enforcers, many Latin American street gangsters were trained to become assassins in the cartel which has a reputation for extreme brutality and violence. In the late 1990s, the cartel was believed to be responsible for supplying nearly half the white powdery substances sold in the United States. The gang made headlines in January 2006 after it was discovered that they had dug tunnels from Tijuana, Baja, California into the United States at Ote Mesa, California. Number 5, Benjamin Arellano Feli. Benjamin was first arrested on the 18th of June 1982 in Downey, California for receiving 100 kilos of a white powdery substance smuggled through the San Ysidro border. However, he escaped custody. The Arellano Feli brothers obtained their first big break in 1989 when they inherited the organization from their uncle Miguel Angel Feli Gallardo after they showed early promise smuggling consumer electronics over the US-Mexico border. By 1998, the Arellano brothers had been indicted in the US for substance trafficking, and Ramon had been put on the FBI's 10 most wanted list, which we covered in a different video actually. Despite the brothers' audacity, they remained untouchable for 13 years. This was accomplished in part with large amounts of cash bribes to Mexican politicians and police commanders at the cost of an estimated $1 million per week. Benjamin Arellano tried to clear his name after the 1993 slaughter of Cardinal Juan Jesus Posadas Ocampo, in which he had been implicated. That high profile assassination brought international attention to his trafficking organization and although this forced Benjamin to lie low and adopt false names, he continued to live in a casual confidence, apparently unafraid of capture. Another one of Benjamin's brothers, Francisco, was arrested soon after a meeting with some people on substance charges and Benjamin, Ramon, and Javier officially became fugitives. Number four, Miguel Caro Quintero. He was born in Caborca, Sonora, Mexico in 1963. Previously arrested in 1992 on charges of tax evasion, he was found not guilty which the DEA attributes to the use of threats and bribes by Caro Quintero. While imprisoned, it is believed Caro Quintero was still running the Sonora cartel, where he is serving a prison sentence for racketeering, substance smuggling, and money laundering.
Carol Quintero was arrested in December 2001 in Los Mokis, Sinaloa. Prior to his arrest, he repeatedly stated he is innocent of the charges and has accused the DEA of pursuing a vendetta against him for his brother Rafael Caro Quintero's alleged role in the execution of DEA special agent Enrique Camarena. Miguel Caro Quintero is noted as having called into a radio station to profess his innocence, stating, if I had a cartel, I'd have a lot of money and my brother wouldn't be there in jail and claiming to be an innocent rancher. He further stated he does not believe his brother was involved in the execution of the DEA agent at all. Number three, Jefe de Jefe. Apparently, this guy was known for executing a DEA agent and was originally going to be sent to prison, but things changed. He was instead only put on house arrest. The Mexican president at the time told the media that he had diseases wrong with him that couldn't be treated in prison, and thus house arrest was issued. I don't know, sounds a bit fishy. Number two, Villarreal Barragan. He was born in Torian, Coahuila on September 21st, 1969, and began his criminal career as a car thief in the state of Coahuila. And in 1990, at age 20, he was admitted to the Coahuila Judicial Police Force. Several years later, in 1993, he was admitted to the Federal Police, which was led by the Office National Security Commission and was stationed at Nuevo Laredo. Villarreal Barragan was then stationed at Reynosa, Tamaulipas, where he worked until 1996, when he established a business relationship with the Juarez Cartel. Between the years of 2007 and 2010, Villarreal Barragan left the Juarez organization to work along with the Gulf Cartel and for Las Zetas, but later incorporated into the Sinaloa Cartel, commanding a criminal cell of the Beltran Leva Cartel. Allegedly, he was hired by the Beltran Leva Cartel and by 2007, he rose to the rank of lieutenant for Arturo Beltran Leva. Following Arturo's death in December 2009, during a shootout with Marines, infighting broke out for the control of the Beltran Leva cartel. One faction is led by lieutenants Edgar Valdez Villarreal and Gerardo Alvarez Vasquez, while the other is led by the current leader, Hector Beltran Leva, and his enforcer lieutenant, Sergio Villarreal Barragan. At number one, Hector Huerta Rios, also known by his nickname La Bura, which means the donkey in English. The donkey. He was a Mexican suspected substance lord and high ranking member of the Beltran Leva Cartel, a criminal group based in Sinaloa. Huerta Rios was the leader of the organization's operations in the city of Monterrey. On March 24, 2009, the Mexican military arrested Huerta Rios at his luxury car dealership in San Pedro Garza Garcia, along with his four bodyguards. Also seized were numerous weapons, including two AK 47s, one AR 15, grenades, and several pistols. 18 luxury vehicles, 8,000 Mexican pesos, and $12,840 in US currency. Puerto Rios was reportedly executed on July 4th, 2019. 